Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Dennis uh, Benderin. And um, I, I initially misread the title as uh, Vicious Electronics in Graphene. Um, I'm somewhat comforted to find it's viscous uh, electronics. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Dennis Benderin. I'm doing experiments in the field of condensed metaphysics. And it's a great pleasure to be here today and talk about the research project which I've been working already for quite a while. It is called Viscous Electronics and Graphene. So the goal of my today's presentation is to convince you that those two seemingly unrelated words, viscous and electronics, can indeed stand together and form a very interesting research direction. To begin with, let me ask you to go back to the time when you were in high school and remember how your teacher introduced your concept of electrical current, electrical voltage, and resistance. Most likely this was done by means of analogy, by means of a simple analogy between an electronic circuit and a hydraulic system containing two water tanks and connected by a narrow pipe. In that case, the uh, voltage was analogous to the difference in the height level between the left and right parts of your hydraulic system, and the water flow was analogous to the electrical current, and the valve which you put in between Acts, as, acts nothing as a resistor, or uh, like a resistor, which impedes the flow of, of, your, of your electrical current or water flow. But then you go to the university, and you learn that this, analog and this analogy is not really accurate. And in particular, if you have a look inside an any, electronic, any electronic circuit, such as that shown in that slide, and you zoom in inside a conductor, connecting different parts of that circuit, you will learn that you know, the, the, the behavior of electrons is pretty much similar to this famous pinball game. So metallic electrons are flying or traveling when you apply an electrical field between one part of your circuit to, to another part of your circuit while bouncing those bumpers which you have in, on, in their way. So those can be crystal defects or lattice imperfections, some impurities, but very important, those particles are quite selfish. They're, they're moving as individuals without really talking to each other. So no matter what happens in one part of your circuitry in here, it's not going to affect it, uh, electrons in the other part of your circuitry. In contrast, if you have a look at any hydraulic system, such as this nice coffee machine which I'm showing you here, the reason I've chosen, why I've chosen this analogy with the coffee machine is because last time with Neil, we had quite a few coffee cups and we had a long conversation about coffee, so I think it might be relevant comparison. So if you look inside uh, such a hydraulic system where you drive hot water through coffee bins by applying a pressure difference, what you see is that water, mo water molecules interact with each other. They're frequently scattering, they're frequently exchanging their momenta, and they're exchanging their positions and flow collectively. So that if they need to overcome some kind of bumper, they would do it collectively. Not only those molecules which are surrounding those particles, those bumpers, will feel its presence, but also those molecules which are far away. A simple example, you can throw a, a rock in a river and you will see that the river will be kind of collectively uh, circumvent, circumnavigating the, this, this, this rock. But then those of us who learn to, continue, to, to, to choose to continue doing condensed metaphysics learn Again, that the initial analogy sometimes is not so insane. And in particular, there are special class of materials such as strange metals, high TC superconductors, some oxides, where the behavior of electrons is pretty much similar to behavior of classical fluids or liquids. Because the interaction in such, in so, in such systems are so important that single particle picture simply cannot explain their properties. So you cannot even picture individual, of electron, individual electrons traveling between those bumpers. You need to think about the quantum soup, which is, a, which is moving inside your, inside your conductor. And obviously, if you have many interacting particles, such, such, the description of such systems is incredibly complex, which bring those systems to the center of research, not only in the condensed metaphysics, but also in various disciplines, as you know, interacting systems are all around us, cold atoms, quark gluon plasmas, everything interacts strongly. Interacting systems are in my, uh, of a particular interest to me too, and uh, I find graphene a very important platform 
for this inquiry, inquiry. And I believe that electrons, interacting electrons in graphene can help us to, to increase our level of understanding of such strongly interacting uh, systems. This is for the following reason. If you take a graphene device and you cool it down, you will see that electrons behave as individuals similar to copper or gold. They will be bouncing between uh, those scatterers as I just described. But if you heat it up and you tune the number of electrons in your graphene channel, what you may have, you may, you, the theory, theory tells us that you should transition to, to this interacting regime where electrons will, ex will rapidly scatter of each other and form a viscous fluid which is flowing inside such a conductor. Despite this theoretical understanding which, which they back to a long time ago, there has been no, practically no experimental proof that this is indeed the case. And that's, that, 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 that's what I'm particularly interested in. But, and, and, and the reason why there has been no experimental proof is pretty simple. There's a very fundamental problem in our condensed matter physics experiments. You know, while people are looking for planets and building colliders, bouncing particles, <laughs> doing very cool experiments, all we do, we drive electrical current and measure voltage and do it as a function of temperature, everything we can, which we can apply, magnetic field, carrier density, we're measuring resistance. And it turns out that usually electron-electron collisions do not contribute to the resistance. And that's very easy to understand. If you take two electrons, which will scatter, the whole momentum, the, the momentum of two particles will be conserved. And if the momentum of, the, of two particles is conserved, the, the momentum of the whole fluid will be conserved in such collisions. Therefore, they will not lose their momentum, and therefore the whole current which you are driving will be conserved. And that is why resistance is not going to be affected by such momentum-conserving collisions. And indeed, if you measure the resistance of conventional graphene device as a function of temperature, what you see, it's a monotonic increase, you know, starting from 10 ohms per square at very low temperatures, at liquid helium temperatures, going to 20 to 30 ohm at room temperature, and you know, this smooth increase can be attributed to electrons scattering from the crystal vibrations to the latest vibrations which become prominent at higher temperatures. And here's the problem. So on the one hand, I told you that the like, theoretical expectations is that electrons should be moving as a, as a quantum soup inside graphene channel. And on the other hand, all the tools which we have is the resistance gives us very simple uh, measurement, me measurement, very simple data. So we need to compensate. We need to find an approach which will allow us to catch this correlated electron motion, which forms the, the goal of, 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 of the work which we've been doing, to find signatures of collective electron flow and measure its viscosity. I've been looking for those signatures for, for already quite a while. We started looking at it a few, few years, quite, quite a few years ago. We found quite a few, and today I'm gonna tell you probably the most, the, probably the simplest to understand uh, approach to do so from on the one hand, and on the other hand, because this approach was, uh, was developed and, and worked together with MIT, with Leonid Levitov's team. The idea is pretty straightforward. What you have to do, you have to cut your device and push electron fluid to go through such, a, through such a constriction. We call this geometry point contact geometry. So what I'm gonna argue is that if you do so, it's much easier for Volt to push this guy through if you have interactions in your system, if you have electron-electron collisions. The reason to start from this, from, 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 with this geometry is pretty straightforward. Let me explain you what I mean by that. So this is one of the devices which we measured, which we studied, and uh, it's a graphene channel, which is cut in many pieces inside, and uh, each, each piece is connected by this, by this small, narrow opening, which, which you, if you zoom in, you will see something like that. And those are metallic leads by which you are measuring voltage drop across each of these junctions. So as I, as I, as I explained you before, at very low temperatures, electrons are expected to behave independently of each other. And in such independent model, only those electrons which have momentum looking towards this orifice can go through. 
all the other electrons like this blue guy will get backscattered. And that will define the, the conductance of such an opening. So the wider the opening, obviously, the, the larger the conductance of such system. And that can be described by this uh, very simple formula, where the conductance is proportional to the width of, the, of, 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 your, of your constriction. It is very important to understand that this is the limit which has been always known to be the maximum conductance possible for, for electrons in such clean systems. So the conductance of any metallic system uh, can be only lower than this maximum limit. So we made those devices and measured them at very low temperatures. We expect to have this free particle motion. And as you can see, the point, the, this, the, the, on this axis I'm plotting you the conductance of such, of such a device as a function of carrier density. So the solid lines are the data, and the dashed lines are the expectations from this formula. We had quite a few constrictions in our device. And you can see the, at low temperatures, the, the agreement is pretty remarkable. Within a few percent, we have uh, good agreement, and the conductance matches to what you expect from the free particle or in, in, in non-interacting limit. Now let's have a look at this particular constriction on, this, on, on its conductance as a function of temperature. So what I'm showing you here is the data taken at low temperatures again, at liquid helium temperatures, and the horizontal lines are the, are the theoretical expectations taken from this formula. So when you increase the temperature, what happens is something really surprising. The conductance of such systems, of such system, goes up. And you never expect the conductance of any metallic system to go up with increasing temperature because you induce more and more scattering from phonons, for instance, from lattice vibrations. But here the conductance goes up instead of going down. And this increase is significant. It can be 15 to 20 percent on top of the maximum allowed limit which you had before in, in all metallic systems. You can test it in other constrictions. And you can always do a control experiment where you have a clean device with no cuts in it. And you will see that in such devices, the conductance go, always goes down, unlike the situation which, which happens here. We call this phenomena superballistic conduction. Let me explain you why it's called superballistic and why is it useful and, uh, and, and important for, for the interaction, for, for the understanding of interacting electrons. As I, as I mentioned before, only those electrons which have momentum looking towards the orifice can go through in the individual free particle limit, and those other electrons which, was, which have momentum looking towards the boundary will get backscattered. If you increase the temperature, particles start to interact. They, sc they start to scatter from each other. And those electrons which were supposed to fly towards the boundary like this guy will now experience mutual collisions with other electrons and follow this kind of zigzag trajectory, like in the flow of water through a, through a constriction. And eventually, for the fixed voltage which you apply to a system, you can push more electrons through such a constriction. And therefore, your conductance goes up. It's very important to understand that this increase is directly related to the rate your particles collide with each other. And this is essentially a measure of electron viscosity. So that by looking at this kind of dependencies of point contact conductance as a function of temperature, you can perform viscometry of electron fluid, which we plot in this, uh, in, in, in this, in this figure, and compare it with the theoretical expectations uh, and observe pretty remarkable agreement between those two. You know, you want to make a comparison between viscosity of electron fluid, fluid and, and, and conventional liquids, and it turns out that electrons are much more viscous than anything which you can think of, water, honey, oil. Maybe it's not as viscous as this guy, as, peach, as the, you can see in the picture experiment, but it, 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 it's, it's going there. With this, I would like you to take away a few messages, which can be summarized by this nice illustration. Graphene is a unique platform to study collective electron phenomena. Uh, electrons can cooperate to overcome dissipation in such a point context, and the electron soup is very viscous. Being a Papalardo Fellow is, is a nice opportunity to, you know, to, to follow the research directions which, which, which you are interested in. And I'm still interested in few experiments which have to be done in this particular viscous regime of electron transport. 
Let me tell you about one of them, which, which we are working on together with, with, with Pablo and Leonid. So you know that if you have a, graphene doesn't have a band gap. And therefore, you cannot make very, despite all the properties, you cannot make a good transistor out of it. You cannot, you cannot build logical elements out of graphene. But let's go back in time when transistors were not as developed as now. In those in 50s and 40s, there existed a discipline which is called fluidics or fluidic logics, where a flow of water can be guided either to one part of your system or to another by perpendicularly applied jet. Even more, there were computers, analogous computer built by the, computers built by this approach, and this Monia computer, which is Monetary National Income Analogous Computer, which is now in New Zealand, was built to predict British economy. It should have predicted Brexit, though, I should say. <laughs> and uh, a natural question which arises, can we take advantage and can we, you know, build an analogy between fluidics and hydrodynamic flow of water in graphene channel, and by driving current in one direction, switching it by perpendicularly applied jet and forcing it to flow into the other direction. Uh, apart from that, I'm extremely interested in, in another, another research direction which I'm following now. I'm looking into the radiation-induced phenomena in different to materials, which, which, which can find its potential use in, in different uh, detection schemes. We can look at collective modes of viscous electron fluid, and so on and so forth. With that, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators uh, and colleagues, in particular, Rashan Krishna Kumar, uh, Marco Polini, and my great teachers, uh, Irina Grigorova and Andre Gaim, with whom we were constantly studying electron hydrodynamics. And of course, I'm very grateful to MIT team uh, of Pablo Javier Herrera, and Isabel Finney, with whom we are making lots of graphene devices these days. And of course, I'm, I'm really grateful to Leonid Levitov, not only who is a source of inspiration and physical ideas, but also for teaching me every day, almost everyday physics. I'm really grateful to Jane and Neil Papalardo for this wonderful opportunity to follow my research interests. Thank you very much for your attention. from the front row. Yeah, I, I don't know if this makes any sense, but carrying your analogy further, if you, the voltage goes up, do you see turbulence? It should be able to see them. Yeah. It should be able to see turbulence, yeah. And the Re Reynolds numbers, which we nowadays can achieve, are the order of 10. So potentially, we can see some development of turbulence stage in viscous electron fluid. Is it complicated to measure that? Yeah, it requires some complicated measurements, though. Like. Juliana. So I have a question that goes in the other direction. Hydrodynamic dynamic systems are quite difficult to model. Could you build devices that allow you to build models of large hydrodynamic systems like astrophysical systems? Well, that's actually a great, a, a great question to ask because that's, that's something which we always think, keep, keep in mind while motivating ourselves to do this kind of experiments. Because like, if you make a graphene device, and you see some phenomena which are associated with viscous electron flow, maybe you can sim in, in, indeed si simulate something which happens in galaxies. You know, there is galaxies of hydrodynamic, oh, there, there are hydrodynamic, hydrodynamics of galaxies, to what I remember, and then you can, where individual particles are the actual galaxies, right? And then you, the, collective, the collective behavior of such galaxies can be treated by the same approach. So potentially, yeah, that can, that, 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 that can be done. Yeah. Uh, Richard. One over T squared behavior in the viscosity, um, that's just the Fermi liquid behavior. Yeah, um, it's, it's, there is a deviation from that because it's not, yeah. Do you see a superconducting transition? No. The effect goes stronger if you go high and high in temperature. So like, you, see, you, you decrease the viscosity and you, you, until the situation, until the moment where your phonons become so important that conductance keep going down because you have lattice vibrations. Salvo? Hey, question. You've talked here that the conductivity goes up before going down. Yeah. Could you theoretically predict the sweet spot before doing the experiment? Yeah, you have always competition between two. This uh, electron-electron collisions happening in your system, and then electron phonon scattering. 
So electron phonon scattering at some point starts to kill this effect, and that's why you have going down. But you can subtract one from another. You can, you will always, you can isolate purely viscous contribution from such measurements. Any more questions? Okay, uh, so we now have, let's thank the speaker again.